This is CNBC.com News Now. All right. Would have liked to uh, be there with, with you all and Don Thane, but we do a big uh, day coming up here in Washington. I want to talk about something that happened here yesterday when my colleague Maria Bartiromo sat down in an exclusive interview with the president. He was pounding the table on his administration's push to expand the use of ethanol as an alternative fuel. We're spending a fair amount of taxpayers' money on research and development on cellulosic ethanol, which is a fancy word for using like wood chips to make ethanol or corn st or stalks or switchgrass. The whole purpose is to incent uh, people to develop the technologies that enable us to get off oil. You, you, can't get, you can't get off oil overnight, but you can diversify away from, from oil over time, and that's precisely what we're doing now in the most substantial ways of any administration in history. The president's comments come against a backdrop of today's crop report. U.S. farmers are now planting a record amount of corn, enough to meet feed and biofuel demand. Weak stockpiles, though, are suffering, dropping to their lowest level in 60 years. That's right, six-decade low. So what does it mean for prices? We have that covered from supply to demand with our CNBC insiders. Elaine Cubb is a grains analyst at DTN. Jeremy Haft is author of All the Tea in China, How to Buy, Sell, and Make Money on the Mainland, and founder and chairman of Beat China B, a supply chain company in China. Thanks to both of you for being with us. Elaine, this was the big kahuna. Uh, we're not talking about Joe Kernan, but this was the big kahuna of crop reports today. I mean, I, I just keep worrying that we are just going to plant so much corn we don't even have room for roads in this country anymore. Well, you're right. We planted a lot of corn, and the market has known that, and the market has dropped from its all-time highs. But now that we, now good that morning. the the reports, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Oh, the reports just pretty much adjust the uh, the issue of how much is actually being harvested for grain and how much uh, is is being yielded on those acres, and so that's why we see some small adjustments. But for the most part, the market is responding neutrally to corn. Uh, one of the adjustments that the USDA made to their uh, supply and demand report this morning does show that we are projected to use a little less corn uh, to produce ethanol this upcoming year. But it's interesting, especially taken in, in conjunction with President Bush's comments about mm -hmm. the fact that the, the U.S. is really encouraging the research and development. We're looking at next year and the previous years and up until 2010 before we really see the peak in ethanol production. But it's still expected to come. Jeremy, can China, with, with their 1.3 billion people, can they make all their own food? Do they have enough? I mean, how much do they import? They import a lot, in fact. China is our number one export market for soybeans and cotton. That continues to be strong. And as China's middle class starts moving up the value chain in the quality of food that they eat, more meat, more eggs, they can't produce that. So the inputs to those, the grains, uh, will be needed to import more and more from the U.S. as well. So they're buying our wheat, our corn, not just our John Deere products. They're actually buying what comes from American farmers. Absolutely, and they have been for the last five years. Again, um, China's the number one export market for our soybeans um, and for our cotton, um, and it continues to grow for corn and for wheat. So, Elaine, how much of the price picture that you look at is a result of overseas demand, you know, specifically China, but overseas overall? Right. You definitely see this international demand, this growing Asian demand for, for cattle feed and chicken feed. You definitely see that in the long-term trends of the market. You see soybean meal and corn definitely rising. Uh, from a day-to-day -day standpoint, uh, you can see you know, some small reactions to these tenders that get issued by Asian countries. But for the most part right now, the markets are reacting day-to-day -day more to a negative correlation with the U.S. dollar index. Big picture, Elaine, then, when you look longer term. Do you just say, all right, you can have day-to-day -day fluctuations, but even though we're in the midst of the biggest bull market ever in agricultural commodities, it's got to keep going up, prices, that is. Well, you can say that if you're looking at it as a demand market, and we have seen a shift. You know, a, a long-term change in demand will have a long-term change in prices, whereas some of these supply concerns, like the, the shortage in wheat, is a supply concern that could be eliminated in the next couple of years if we can get a few drought-free years to produce enough wheat. So the long-term shift has occurred. We've seen that. But you're right, if we have just supply issues, that'll be a shorter term effect. Jeremy, can I ask you a question? You're talking about how much food China buys from overseas, you know, particularly from the United States. Mm. Do they want to be independent on that measure? I mean, not have to import? 
Does China want to be independent in that measure? Right, to be able to grow their own food. Well, I, I hear you. I, I don't think China really has a choice. Um, they're dealing with massive, as we know, environmental issues. Um, a lot of that country is desert. The desert is encroaching more and more on arable land. Most of China's population lives on the size of the state of Texas. So it's really not a matter of choice or convenience with China. It's actually a matter of necessity. All right, Elaine and Jeremy, thank you very much. Thank Interesting you. and certainly a clear view of the fact that demand certainly isn't going away for key ag commodities.